Once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children of all ages, you are now tuned into the Prince of Investment, coming to you guys and girls live all the way from the beautiful city and state of Denver, Colorado, via the also beautiful city and state of Honolulu, Hawaii. If you haven't done so already, please go ahead and make sure you hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button. And as always, I don't have a lot of time, and I definitely know you guys and girls don't have a lot of time, so we could jump straight into it. Ladies and gentlemen, we got a very special topic with the also special guest as well. We're talking about the global investing market. When this came across my desk, I had to take it because I'm so used to talking about the everyday market that we know about here in America. You know, we're known for capitalism here in America. We're known about our market, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, Dow, and things like that. But there are other markets out there as well across the globe. Some of the markets... I'm a little bit afraid to jump into because of, you know, things like political risk and maybe not knowing things like that. But there's, uh, ignorance is not an excuse to not get better at something. So today, we got a very special guest. Let me give you a soft introduction of him. His name is Darren Ackerson. He's a veteran portfolio manager, and he's the author of his new book that you guys and girls seen come up, The Global Investing, A Practical Guide to the World's Best Financial Opportunities a book that I haven't had the opportunity to check out yet, but I will be checking out myself. So Darren himself, he is the a PM, which is, you know, an investing world people call portfolio managers, you know, uh, for simplicity purposes, a value partner's investment with the AUM, assets under management, about $4.1 billion. He's out of Canada right now, and he has, you know, he's done so much in the investing world across the globe. Um, he's a subject matter expert in this. So without further ado, I know you guys and girls are tuning to sit here and watch and hear me. Without further ado, let me bring on my guest today, Mr. Darren Eckerson. How you doing, Darren? Very well, Prince. Thank you very much for having me on the show today. Okay. Thank you. Now, for the people out there, I know I kind of touched on your um your background there. Can you tell people a little bit more about yourself a little bit more about yourself and you know what do you do and your extensive history in the investing world? Yeah, absolutely. I've been uh, managing public equity funds or uh, pools for well over 20 years now. Um, actually, the bulk of that was um, as a U.S. equity investor. I worked for an insurance company here in Canada and managed um, pool, different pools of U.S. equity funds uh, for you know close to 15 years. Um, but about a decade ago, I got into the global equity uh, space. And, you know, as much as the U.S. is a fantastic place to invest, it is, and it always will be, uh, there are, at different times, better opportunities available outside the U.S., outside North America. So that's something I'm really focused on right now. And um, just happy to be here and be able to spread the word about uh, global investment. Okay. Now, you, you touched on the point that how great America is when it comes down to investing, uh, you know, just been in the cap, market cap and things like that. We've got a couple of things going on right now. This, this crazy thing called inflation that we're trying to get rid of. And then we got interest rates trying to get rid of and, you know, trying to get the, the inflation is trying to, the interest rates are trying to suppress the inflation at the same time, you know, back in 2020 during the, the global pandemic, when we saw, uh, you know, we pumped trillions of dollars into our economy, stimulating the economy to avoid, uh, you know, a, a depression for the most part. Now we have this inflation. We're trying to get rid of it. We're trying to, you know, it's, but it's like toothpaste. When you squeeze it out of the tube, it's kind of hard to put it back. So what are your thought processes on the current economy of the inflation and, you know, the interest rates at the same time? It, without a doubt, that's a, a key headwind for the U.S. market. The, the amount of stimulus that was pumped into the system as a result of first the financial crisis, of course later the pandemic, um, really was unprecedented. And that's great in the short term, it certainly propped up, um, I shouldn't say short term for the past decade, plus it's, it's propped up corporate profits, corporate revenue and, and the US economy. It's, done, it's been very effective at that. The problem, as you alluded to now, is inflation has become a problem. And in order to uh, keep inflation under control, the central bank has to raise interest rates to try and cool economic growth. 
And that's a headwind uh, going forward for the U.S. While you didn't have that happen in a lot of foreign economies, parts of, of Asia, Latin America, even you know Eastern Europe, they didn't have the funds available to pump into the system to help support the economy, help support corporate profits. That was the problem in the past, but going forward, they don't have that headwind of interest rates having to go up and, and for the, um, the money, the liquidity that was pumped into the financial system, they're not having to worry about taking it out because they didn't put it in in the first place. So for them, it's now on a relative basis, it's a tailwind for those. Very. Okay, let me make sure I got this correct. You're saying, hey, America, uh, you know, we printed up all this money. We pumped it out in stimulus packages. We gave, uh, you know, people checks. We gave businesses checks. We had the PPP loans. All these things we did to avoid, avoid a, a depression in a way. And you're saying other countries did not do that so that they don't have this inflation that's built into them. Am I, am I getting that correct? Yeah, exactly. You know, they didn't they didn't have the resources that the U.S. has or other developed countries like Canada, uh, Western European countries that were able to pump a lot of money into their system, financial system. They didn't have that available. So it was a, a drag for them or, you know, a, a headwind previously. But now they're not having to to remove it from the financial system. So that going forward, that's going to be, um, you know, a. a relative headwind for the U.S. and other developed nations. Oh, that's a pretty good point there. When you look at the global, you know, here in America, we get so zoned into our economy and, hey, we have the best economy and, you know, this is us and nothing else is round and blah, blah, that we don't look across the board because, you know, and a lot of it is that, you know, you're just not aware, you know, you're just not aware of, hey, what's going on, how that economy works and, you know, things like that. Now, uh, what are some of these countries that you're saying, hey, you know, this is, in, you know, instead of having a, a headwind of an inflationary problem, that this is now their tailwind because, hey, they didn't have the resources. It's almost like this book I read called The Power of Broke. It was like, hey, just, you know, by you being broke, sometimes having too much money can cause you problems. Having, you can have too many resources. When if you were just broke, a lot of things, you would became, you're more, and the whole concept is that you are more creative and you use more of your intuitions, you use more resources when you're broke versus sometimes when you have a lot of money and a lot of resources, you kind of overdo it and take too much. So now that this created a tailwind for some countries, what do you think are some of the countries that this is a tailwind for? What is your insight on that? Certainly a lot of developing nations. Um, you know, people also refer to them as emerging markets, but you know, that's really, I, I think that that term is quite outdated. And if you look at, you know, a, a country like South Korea, for example, where uh, Samsung is domiciled, um, you know, you look at the technology that's being employed by these businesses and even the infrastructure that those cities have been built on, you know, it, it, it's first world, you know, without a doubt. Like this is very advanced technology. And so, those countries, a lot of them are benefiting from much higher populational growth than we're seeing in North America. For example, it's estimated that between now and 2060, North America will add 1.4 million people per year to, to their population. If you look outside North America, the number is 53 million. So today, nine, the, the rest of the world, if you will, excluding Canada and the U.S., has 19 times the population, and that gap is going to continue to grow going forward. So that population growth helps support economic growth and wealth creation. So right now, if you look outside North America, there are three times as many publicly traded companies that generate four times the corporate revenue. And it's easy to, to be complacent because we have such great businesses in North America it's easy to lose sight of that fact, but the reality is those areas like Indonesia, uh, South Korea, uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, even, even Eastern Europe, countries there, and Africa, those offer some tremendous opportunities to invest in first 
world-class businesses, like world-leading businesses in many cases. Okay. So when someone has this type of knowledge of saying, hey, we're going to, uh, we're going to, you know, do things better, get better, and things like that, would a retail investor, everyday retail investor who's not on the institutional level, do you think a retail investor have a chance for this or just most, mostly on the private equity alternative markets to be able to take advantage of, you know, the global markets? I absolutely think retail investors can take advantage of this. There's a number of ways to do it. And I, I always, uh, I'm a big proponent of doing your homework, your, your due diligence, if you will. And I think it's very important to know what you own and why you own it. So, you know, to, to spend, be able to spend the time to look at a business, try to look under the hood and understand why this company is doing well, I think is critical. And, you know, that, that obviously takes time and not everyone has the time to do that. So for those folks, you know, one way to go about this is to find a, a, a pool, a mutual fund, if you will, that is looking at those businesses and buying good businesses at good prices from around the globe. I think that's that's one way, easy way to to uh, get exposure to these uh, these great opportunities. If you if you do have time and you can actually look at the companies and and make sure that you are investing in high quality businesses. And when I when I say that, I'm typically referring to global industry leaders. Like we're looking for, you know, the best companies in an industry or sector when you look at the entire global landscape. And so, you know, an example would be rather than just look at Oracle, if you're looking at, you know, like a database management company, you could also look at SAP, which is headquartered in Germany. And so very, very good company. Um, there's a lot of examples like that where rather than look at a domestic business, you could have a loan, you could compare it to one of its global competitors and see which one is, you know, currently more favorable. And right now, when you compare foreign businesses to, um, to the U S you know, broadly speaking, Many of them are trading at substantial discounts. Uh, when you look at a forward, like forward-looking price-to-earnings ratio, for example, mm -hmm. foreign markets are trading at roughly a 33% discount to the S and P 500 today. So that's great opportunity if you if you know what businesses to look for. There's some great companies out there that are really world-class industry leaders that you can buy at significant discounts to their U.S. peers. Okay. Now, something I've been noticing, you know, you made a good point about saying, hey, take your American business and compare it to its global competitor. Because, you know, so often here in America, we take Walmart compared to Target. Uh, we take Apple compared to Microsoft. You know, we kind of stay in our sectors, and I'm guilty of that myself. But then saying, hey, what is the Apple in Europe? Let's compare the Apple in Europe and look at their finances, you know, the 10 Qs and 10 Ks to see, you know, well, do we see something here, you know? So the thing is, no, as of late, Warren Buffett has been making um, a lot of headway in going into Japan. Um, what do you think about, you know, Warren Buffett jumping into that global market of jumping into um, Japan? I think it's fantastic. You know, everyone knows Warren Buffett's a very astute investor, and he's he's picked up on something that I think is a very, it's a terrific opportunity. Japan ha still has a reputation for being, um, I, I think, somewhat backward from a, a corporate governance perspective. Mm -hmm. When there was there was a period, a prolonged period of uh, you know no corporate earnings growth. A lot of uh, the mentality was that if you had a, a job working for a Japanese company, you were employed for life, and it just made Japanese companies uncompetitive relative to a lot of their global peers and the Japanese government under Abe uh, for a period of, you know, 10 or 12 years really tried to change that mentality 
And actually, when you look at, at corporate earnings in Japan, they had the best improvement over that decade relative to major indices, major markets around the world. So in, in the pool I manage, Japan is the single largest country exposure. Um, I don't have, uh, uh, right now it's purely international. I don't have any U.S. exposure at all in it. Um, and and the, reason, the reason I don't, though, is because we have other dedicated U.S. equity funds. So we wanted something that's complementary. It's not, it's not a reflection of the U.S. Okay, yeah, I was almost scared there for a second. I got scared. Yeah. Was scared. <laughs> it's like, do we have now? I'm like, oh, my God. But okay, okay, I got you, I got you. So that, that's why I want to qualify that, why Japan is the biggest weight. So if the U.S. was included in this pool, it would be the largest single weight at, at the country level. But... Um, again, we're trying to provide a complement to other securities, other uh, pools that people hold. And so the way we're doing that is we're investing com strictly outside of North America. And so Japan, you know, um, some of the trading companies, I think, is where uh, Warren Buffett was focused on. And, and we actually have an investment in one of those uh, businesses as well. Japan, I mean, the, the companies are quite inexpensive. They're extremely well run. Mm -hmm. You know, a company like Nintendo, for example, which um, I don't know if anyone has seen the, the recent Super Mario's movie, but it, it uh, broke uh, records globally for, for an animated film. And they are just starting to monetize their intellectual property. They have some of the best franchises in video games, and they've really only just started to uh, to take advantage of that. So there's some great companies there that, um, you know, I, I think Japan is a good story for the, for the next, you know, several years at this rate. Okay. Now, one of the side effects of having these high interest rates, I know these interest rates in America will sleep for a while. Um, now that we're uh, starting to wake up with the inflation, one of the benefits of that has been, you know, we're seeing savings accounts and CDs and uh, things like that, more conservative investments start to turn around a nice return, 5%. But as I look broadly, you know, I noticed Brazil was paying 14%. You know, other countries, governments are paying, you know, double digits in the interest rates department and the bonds, just for government bonds, are now becoming more relevant again. What do you think about investing broadly in the bond market, even though, um, you take on that political risk. You know, right now we know tensions are kind of high with China and the United States and um, everybody's kind of picking sides. How do you look at, how do you factor that into your global investing? It's a great question. You know, currency um, is usually how that plays out. It, it would, any geopolitical risk or event, uh, social unrest, or, or as we're seeing it with Ukraine and Russia, um, political or sorry, military conflict, um, that usually hits the currency markets first. Um, the way the way that I think about and, and manage risk, geopolitical risk, is I look at the sovereign credit rating of the country that the company is located in. So one thing I do is a very simple way to help. Uh, protect yourself when you're investing globally is to only invest in countries that have sovereign credit ratings of investment greater or better. And anyone can look this up. You can go on on um, S and P's website or other other bond Which website. Uh, S and P Global. S for example. Global. Okay. There there are there are others too. Any, any bond rating site typically has sovereign credit ratings as well for countries. So if you look at anything triple B minus or higher, then you look you're you're relatively safe. These are these are countries that are deemed investment grade by the big US credit rating agencies. And so that that sort of keeps you out of the the most obvious trouble spots. Okay, so I, I get that you're saying hey first start with the bond rating. See what countries have the top investment grade bond ratings, and then if they have um, on the up and up on the bond ratings, then you will look into making investments globally. Am I getting that correct? 
Okay. To kind of tie into that, when you look at some of the, what are some of the underlying dynamics of the world major global industries? You know? Well, yeah. Um, so that, that's another key thing for investors to understand, especially if you're a retail investor and you're doing this yourself. Um, the financial markets are very much interconnected and play off of each other. So the bond market, watching the bond market is important to how the equity markets are going to, uh, to perform. Same with currencies. So, for example, on the currency front, you know, you want to avoid investing in countries that have high levels of, uh, of debt that they're not, that they may not be able to, uh, well, to manage. So high levels of debt, high levels of inflation are sort of a warning sign for investors. And I'm not talking about what we're seeing now in, in, in the U.S. and Canada and Western Europe. That I'm not talking about, you know, five, six, seven percent inflation. I'm, I'm you know, talking about much higher levels with much higher debt levels. That is where it becomes a concern. Um, but the other thing is, um, you know, the bond market, the change in interest rates and the change in uh, credit defaults. So as you see, credit defaults start to pick up in in the bond market or, you know, when you're looking at a bank, if banks start reporting higher and higher credit defaults or loan losses, then that's something that typically will find its way into the equity market as well and is a, a sign of a, a coming uh, problem. Yeah, let me let me rephrase that. You were saying, hey, keep an eye on the bond market. And if you notice in the bond market, if grades started to, uh, companies started to carry on more debt or the grades start to slip and, you know, you're seeing more people uh, default on their loans, then that is the indicator of what's going to trickle its way into the equity market. I got that correct? That's correct. Nice. Okay, that's a that's a pretty good um, nugget there. Now, I want to ask this question. How to construct a portfolio of global stocks that will help you to build wealth and protect it during times of stock market weaknesses? Really, the key there is to buy good businesses and not overpay for them. So, you know, you, you don't want to invest in in a company where the industry is shrinking. So you do want growth. You want some, some growth, you know, at least uh, at, at the rate of GDP or better. But you don't necessarily need to buy the fastest growing stocks, especially if they're trading at very, very rich multiples. So when you think back to tech bubble and in, in, um, the tech boom and then, and then the bubble back in the late 90s and then the early 2000s, a lot of those stocks uh, reached astronomical valuations, and it took a very long time for, for many of them to recover. Some didn't. Some never uh, made it through the, the tech uh, bubble bursting in 01 and 02. But the, the key here, I think, is to buy good businesses and don't overpay for them. And they, will, they may not be the, the hot commodity of the time. But they will create wealth for you, and they will, they will, uh, you know, make you wealthy over time if you if you just stick to them and and continue to uh, to add to them. It, when the market sells off, the businesses you like are on sale, and it's time to put more money to work. So that first and foremost, when when stocks get cheap, don't panic. Put more money to work, and it will eventually come out in your favor. And if you have a strong fundamental company, I just came out of this book called The Little Book That Can That Beats the Market, Joel Greenblatt, I think his name is. And he always speaks about um, if you're right on the fundamentals, the market would eventually reward you. So you look at the fundamentals that we, you know, you and I both know that the market doesn't trade off of its value. The market trades off of what people are buying, volume, essentially what people are buying and selling. Now, if you're sitting there, you have a great company, the fundamentals look great, it's in a great sector, at what point, and let's say, but it's not performing on the market, you know, 
is fundamentals of performing what the market is not performing. At what point do you say, man, maybe I got this wrong? Or do you just hold on and ride it until the wheels fall off? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. It's easy to buy stocks, buy companies. It's much, much more difficult to know when to sell. And I think, you, you know, it's a judgment call, unfortunately. But I think this is the one piece of advice I would give any investor. Think like a business owner. If you own the entire company, would you want to sell it that day at the current valuation? Or is it something that is going to work its way through and, and you know, you'll, you'll get through that. And so to, to Joel Greenblatt's point, you know, if you're buying high quality businesses, they have, first of all, a high quality management team. That should be able to navigate through tough, tough times and come out stronger on the other end, not buying companies that have very high levels of debt. You know, you want some financial flexibility. And when we get into periods like we're in now with rising interest rates, that can become a problem for companies that have a lot of debt. Um, you know, companies that are able to generate strong cash flow, don't have a lot of debt, have good management teams typically will be able to get through tougher times. So that's, if you think of it like a business owner, you own the entire business, would you sell it? Like if, if you spent a decade building, you know, a great um, manufacturer of widgets, whatever, and suddenly, you know, you, we get into a recession, your company, you know, is, is down, you're not selling as much but you're pretty confident that you're going to survive, then why would you sell it today at the lowest possible valuation when, you know, you know you can get through, manage it and get through and see better times ahead? So that that's, I'm not sure if that mm -hmm. is a clear answer to your question, but I would encourage people to really look at why is the company underperforming? And if they think that it's something that it's going to work its way through or work its way out in time, then just stick with it. Okay. And if this is something fundamentally wrong with it, something has changed and you think they're not going to be able to recover, then you should sell. That was a very great nugget to like look at as a business owner and say, hey, if you own Uber, for example, you know, I've always been hot on Uber for now for a couple of years. And would you be selling it if you were, you know, the CEO or would you be trying to keep it? But one, two, two things I want to ask before you get out of here. What are your thoughts on this cryptocurrency? You know, it's a whole other sector that got birthed in the last decade on a global market. What are you thinking? You know, you're seeing it kind of, you know, it kind of died off in the last year or two. Nobody's kind of talking about it, but just year to date, you kind of seeing it come back. What do you think? What are your thoughts? My, my perspective on it has been to trade carefully. Blockchain is great technology. There's a lot of potential applications for blockchain, which is what crypto, as you know, what, what crypto is built on. Cryptocurrency is a little bit of a different thing, though. Like, if you think about it, these uh, cryptocurrency potentially competes with fiat currency, like the U.S. dollar. And it's hard to believe that governments like the U.S. government um, or British government or Japanese government are going to hand over control of the major uh, currency or form of, of trade to something that they have really no control over. There's, there's really nothing of substance backing cryptocurrency other than the fact that people believe it's worth something. There's no assets. It's simply we agree to you know, Bitcoin is worth X dollars on a given day. Um, with businesses buying directly into a business that has assets and cash flow, I think is a much safer long-term investment for you and can create just as much wealth over a significant period of time. Okay. Now, um, before we get out of here, I want to bring up your book again, Global Investing, out in Hawaii, if you can hear me here. Uh, let's put his book cover up here again. And the people who made it all the way down to the, his uh, end of his interview here, Global Investing, first two people to comment on YouTube, Eric, um, will be 
we will um ship you a free copy um on you know on from the show for Eric here, Global Investing. If you really like the show and you're like, hey, I want to grab his book, we would definitely ship it out to you. So, Eric, before we get out of here, is there anything you want to say? Um, how people how people can follow you, get more information. What do you want to leave out there for the the live audience and the audience that would catch the playback? Just uh, encourage everyone to think globally when they invest. Whether you buy foreign businesses or not, you're still the companies you invest in are still impacted and still compete with those companies. So it's best to understand the global investment environments and the companies that are out there. And I'd I'd say just you know do your homework and uh, and just stick with it. When times get tough, just buy more. All right, Eric, we definitely enjoyed having you on. Would you come back on to the show? I'd love to. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All Thanks right, so much. boys and girls and children of all ages, into the next video podcast, cartoon, or whatever else crazy you see me doing around the globe. My name is Prince Dykes. This is the Prince of Investment coming to you live from the beautiful city and state of Denver, Colorado, via Honolulu, Hawaii. Until next time, peace, be safe. I'm out, and thank you. Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.